Let me now go back to the concept of Dirac delta function. Let me show you the plot again once more of a delta of t. As you will remember, this function is zero everywhere with the exception of t equals to zero where it takes an infinite value and it's indicated graphically by this arrow. Now because of this property, if I ask you which is the graph of a new function, which is the sum of two functions, the delta t and the delta t shifted, translated, centered in a generic point t of k, t of k is known, is fixed, say it 32, then it's easy to think of this as a superposition of the graphs. Why is this the case? Well, because both functions are zero everywhere. So unless they are overlapping, say unless this second Dirac delta is positioned exactly at this point, and this is not the case because t of k is, say, positive and non-zero, then they are going to kind of build up without interfering with each other. Here you get the effect of the first because the other is zero everywhere, and here you have the effect of the second because the first was zero everywhere. So, summing together two delta functions results in the superposition of their graphs. This is obviously a property of the Dirac deltas or any other functions where they have sufficiently, sufficiently large range where the function takes zero values. Let me go, instead of summing two Dirac delta functions, summing a larger number, what I call a train of Dirac delta functions. So, I cons I'm considering the uh, horizontal axis, the axis of t, say this represents times, and I'm thinking of a set of infinite points. They do not necessarily need to be equally spaced. Actually, here I'm defining the distance, and the distance between any of these two uh, uh, points is fixed. Say I call it delta t, but this is not really required. So I have many of them, and I have one here, one here. They don't need to be equally spaced, and they are covering the entire range of the x-axis, from minus infinity to plus infinity. But they are occurring at discrete locations. So if I ask you to plot the graph of a function that which is obtained by uh, shifting or centering for each of these points, a Dirac delta, so you see here, delta of t, delta of t minus t1, minus t2, etc. And of course here I'm not writing the other infinite num number of terms, preceding the, the Dirac delta located in uh, zero, well, you would probably guess that for the same concept of superposition that we uh, encountered in the previous slide, you're going to end up with the uh, quite infinite sequence of this Dirac delta. They are not going to interfere with each other because they are zero wherever the other is uh, non-zero, simply because these points are not coincident, they are not overlapping. And if you allow me to use a different notation just for the sake of simplicity, I would like to, say, at some point finish this video, so if I have to write this infinite sum or infinite series of terms, well, I will never be over and we are not going to be having uh, a lunch. So I'm using once more this notation with a, a sigma sign, which represents the signs of a sum, and here I'm using this generic index k, where k goes from minus infinity to plus infinity, so it goes from, say, minus 100, minus uh, 99, 98, 97, up to zero, and then 1, 2, 3, 4, it's all covering the set of integer numbers. And I can compactly refer to this sum with this uh, concise notation. Of course, in the case where these uh, points are equally spaced, well, you can replace t with k with a multiple, an integer multiple of the common distance between two subsequent points. Let's see what we can do with this train of Dirac deltas. We can perform something which is uh, underlining the fact that you are hearing my voice, for instance, in this case, uh, of your uh, listening to this video, as a kind of sampling of an originally continuous signal, like, say, this function f of t. This would be as a function of time my voice recorded by a microphone. But, you know, computers and videos are digital, so they rely on a discrete set of points. And what I'm proposing here is to examine, just for the sake of the exercise, and it will be become clear 
in a moment why this is useful, to consider a train of Dirac delta, a function f of t, and then to multiply this f of t times the train of Dirac delta. I would like to just express it in a little bit more uh, uh, effective way, just to reveal this concept of the deadly embrace that I already mentioned below the sign of the integral. Here there is no sign of integral, but still this uh, train of Dirac deltas is zero everywhere where a Dirac delta is not appearing, is not centered. So f of t times this can be rewritten equivalently by bringing the f of t inside the sum of the sign of sum and then specifying that it's only the generic uh, point t with k where the function is going to be calculated at that it's surviving because everywhere else all the other points are basically irrelevant. So that's it is in this sense that this is an equivalence. All the rest of the points of f of t are gone. And although this would be a different story, would be a different topic, this is roughly equivalent to represent digitally on a computer with a set of discrete numbers, a continuous varying signals like f of t, my voice. What you're hearing is a series of discrete samples, each represented and re rendered afterwards uh, from the loudspeakers of your computer in a way that it's still intelligible. And the reason for this, just opening and closing quickly a parenthesis, is because these uh, points or these sampling or the number of these Dirac delta is very, very frequent. So they are very, the distance between two successive points is very small. So that, well, you don't make a big difference, big, a big mistake in approximating the function with a straight line. Roughly speaking, this is the concept uh, underlying the fact that you're hearing my voice on a digital device. But let me go back to the continuous case, which I like very much because nature is continuous, at least to, at least to some extent at the scale, at the macroscopic scale. So here is what I just uh, proposed to you. So if you take a function and you multiply by a, a train of Dirac delta, well, you end up with uh, something that is not the original function. It's a collection of points, and each is acting as a multiplication prefactor of, a, of the individual Dirac deltas. It might be good, it might be not that good. Let me, however, now think of using a different trick, not a discrete set of points on the x-axis, not a discrete set of Dirac deltas, but it continues. There are still going to be an infinite amount, but there are, in a way, they are more numerous than what they were before. In a way, I'm invoking a concept which is known cardinality of the continuous. So, the total number of real numbers, so 0 0.1, 0 0.11111, 0 point, etc., are more numerous than the number of integers, minus 1, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, etc. But let's not deal in this mathematical abstractions. Just let me do an analogy, a, say a typographical analogy. You see here the individual elements were called t with k. And k was an index that was ranging discreetly from minus infinity to plus infinity. Here, let me write the same product. But let me rewrite t of k with tau. Tau is going to be continuously changing from minus infinity to plus infinity. So even reaching points which were in between the two successive Dirac delta of these k's. So you will remember that when I review, refresh the concept of the integral, I made a comparison between the sum and the integral, and I basically said, well, the sum and the integrals are very much related. In one case, it's the sum uh, brought to an infinite limit, stretched to an infinite limit. So let me do the same here. This sum corresponds to an integral when the number of elements that you are summing is infinite. And let me look at this. Well, this looks really familiar. It's an integral between minus infinity to plus infinity of a product of two functions, where when one function, one of the two functions, is been flipped and uh, rigidly shifted by some parameter here that is t, so t is not the integration variable. Well, it looks very much like the convolution integral. So this is the convolution between f and a single Dirac delta. Why this is interesting? 
Because you should remember now one interesting property of a Dirac delta. Whenever it's below the sign of the integral and it's embracing another function, so there is a product with another function, this uh, Dirac delta has the funny property of having just one, one value of this function surviving. The only value where the, that survives is where the Dirac delta is calculated, and the Dirac delta is calculated for tau equals t. So this is the only value that is surviving. On the left, the convolution, in, the convolution of f times uh, a Dirac delta was a function, so there was one number for each t, and on the right, indeed, we still have a function, f of t for each value of the independent variable t. So it seems a little bit mind-twisting. We take the f of t, we convolve it with the Dirac delta, and we get the f of t again. This is a property, and you might have to accept it the way it is. But if you consider it in comparison to this case of sampling, this is a way to sampling accurately, in the most accurate way possible, a generic function f of t with a very dense, infinitely dense train of Dirac deltas. And later we will see that this kind of composition, this is a superposition of Dirac delta, each with, the, uh, with a given constant, with a given coefficient, and if this is the case, can lead to very useful use and applications when we are going to examine differential equations.